This is Digital Health Today, episode 47. When their son was diagnosed, he was the one getting up in the middle of the night. He was the one trying to give insulin and make sure that his son uh, landed in the right place, never too low, never too high. And he immediately, being exposed to it in such an intimate way, uh, realized that this is a math problem and it's ridiculous that nobody has any technology available in order to help solve it. Welcome to Digital Health Today, the podcast focused on the leaders, innovators, and technologies transforming healthcare today and tomorrow. Find us online at digitalhealthtoday.com. This episode is brought to you by DocSF, the digital orthopedic conference bridging digital health and clinical orthopedics. DocSF will be held in San Francisco on Sunday, January 7th, 2018. Join world class leaders in healthcare in this jam packed meeting and enjoy a 30% discount. Just visit docsf.org and use discount code DHT30. That's docsf.org and use discount code DHT30. Welcome back. This is Digital Health Today, the place to be to get the insights of leaders working to make the healthcare of tomorrow available today. I'm your host, Dan Kendall, and this is episode 47. What do you do when you get bad news? Do you moan and complain about it? Maybe you steal yourself and you decide not to let it dominate you and just carry on taking the setbacks in stride. Or maybe you're one of the group of people who takes that decision even further and resolves to declare war on the obstacles before you. And you dedicate your work, energy, and resources to not just overcome those challenges, but to completely transform the situation and experience of others who are facing and will face similar challenges. Considering you've self-selected into this digital health community, I'm guessing that you're one of the two latter groups and... Let's face it, you're probably in the last group. That's the group that Unity Stokes would call the change makers and transformers. People in that group don't just refuse to accept the status quo, but they go to work to change the way the world works, to create new paradigms and shape new ways of thinking. My guest today definitely falls into that group, and I think there's a superpower that comes into play when the challenge that life deals us doesn't simply affect us, but it affects someone we love and care about. In this episode, I speak with Jeffrey Brewer, CEO and co-founder of Bigfoot Biomedical. He shares his story of when he received the news that his son has diabetes and the confusion and despair that followed. He explains how that led to changes in his life and took him down a path that has seen him start Bigfoot Biomedical. He tells us about the tremendous progress they've made in a short space of time and what the future holds for his product and, importantly, for people with insulin-dependent diabetes around the world. As always, you can get all the show notes from this podcast and even watch a video of Jeffrey. Just go to digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 47. While you're there, please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and join our community. And you know I love it when you leave a review on iTunes. If you leave a comment, I'll be able to read your username and give you a shout out on the show. All right, enough with the introductions. Let's move on to the conversation with Jeffrey Brewer. Jeffrey, thanks very much for joining me. Welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me. Jeffrey, I I looked at your bio, and I want to kick off with some of the work that you did for Kickstart, not to be confused with Kickstarter. Uh, You were chairman of Kickstart for seven years, and that was a group that was helping poverty-stricken people become more self-sufficient. You left that group and joined JDRF, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. That's an organization I used to do some volunteer work, actually, back when I lived in New Jersey, back in the mid-90s. What was the draw that took you from one organization to JDRF? Well, in uh, about 2002, uh, not about actually, precisely, September 19th, 2002, my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and that had coincided with my uh, stepping back with some dot-com businesses that I had founded and, and taken public, and that was the time when I was going to think about doing something else with my life, and uh, as I like to say, that, that cause picked me rather than me picking it. I had uh, an interest in spending the next stage of my life in doing some philanthropic work, Kickstart we just talked about, but the main driver in terms of my nonprofit activities for about 12 years was type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes as they used to call it. And when my son was diagnosed, uh, it was a big shock. I didn't know a lot about diabetes type 1 versus type 2, but I quickly came to understand that my son's life would be dependent upon this drug called insulin, that it would need to be administered all throughout the day based on a very complex dosing regimen that required a lot of calculations, a lot of measurements, a lot of planning and prediction, 
and that it was it was a very complicated and calculating task that now the parents would be responsible for because he was seven years old at the time, but one day he'd be responsible for. And I was shocked at the lack of technology that had been applied to this problem in a world where we could land 747s on autopilot and send a missile halfway around the world and have it drop within a couple meters. Uh, it just seemed ridiculous that all I was given, and this was at the best care center in New York City, needles, vials of insulin, and literally a hand-drawn sliding scale of if this, then do that. It was a math problem, and yet there was no technology that was being applied to it. It seemed unacceptable to me. So I began a journey that led me first to a medical device conference for diabetes tools, literally two weeks later. Started asking questions and found out there were things like insulin pumps, uh, continuous glucose monitors. There was even the idea of tying them together in a feedback loop with software that was being tested on dogs. And, and I said, hey, uh, it sounds like that's uh, an interesting path. You know, when am I going to be able to buy that and put it on my son? And I found out that, that wasn't happening anytime soon because there were all sorts of challenges. And the, the challenges uh, were things like uh, R&D budgets at medical device companies where they had better opportunities to invest in other areas. FDA didn't know anything about software and medical devices for dosing a drug. Uh, the payers didn't want to pay for the existing tools because they were too complicated and didn't actually work very well in practice with the general population. So I went to JDRF, and as a donor, we started a project called the Artificial Pancreas Project that was going to try and solve some of these problems. And over about uh, five or six years, we raised $100 million and went and invested that to do research, uh, prove in a, a clinical setting that you could actually tie together insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors, automatically dose insulin. It was safer than what people were doing for themselves today. We went and worked with the FDA to get a path through in terms of testing for safety and efficacy, uh, worked with insurance companies to reimburse continuous glucose monitors. I, I was active as a volunteer and a board member and oversight of this project. And then it I guess at some point uh, they figured I had so much time on my hands and so much interest that they asked me to be the full-time CEO of that organization. And that's what I did for uh, four years. Wow. That's incredible. So just going back to your son's diagnosis, what did that feel like for you and your wife when you got that? What was the, the feeling immediately when you got that diagnosis? And how did you two work together to, to say, okay, how are we going to tackle this? And, and now this is a new reality. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's devastating. Um, it changes uh, your whole life. It, uh, uh, the, the sense of vulnerability, the sense of burden, uh, the sense of uh, threat and, and, and mortality in uh, a chronic disease and one that's dangerous to live with on a daily basis. I mean, this drug uh, and this disease, it's very peculiar in terms of chronic disease. It's something that comes to a relatively large number of people. And we're talking about a million and a half people in this country have it. It comes mostly earlier in life, uh, meaning before 18, although about half of the people are diagnosed after 18 as well. So juvenile diabetes is not uh, really the right name. That's why they changed it. But, but it is every day, and there's this danger and, and, and burden and worry associated with it. Because literally, if you give yourself too much of this drug, which people do all the time, you can render yourself unconscious, and if nobody's around to help you, you, you can die, and people do. They die in the middle of the night um, because they gave themselves too much insulin before they went to sleep. But then on the other hand, the doctor tells you if you don't give enough of it um, uh, consistently across the day, you're going to run high blood sugar. And in uh, a relatively short or you know, medium term, you're, you're going to have kidney failure, amputation, blindness, uh, a heart attack, a stroke. So it, it's actually devastating to have to live with this uh, for a child especially. Um, where you know life was, uh, even though it might have seemed stressful and complicated before, it, it just became exponentially more so, and and that happened overnight. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm a parent myself, and you know it's one of those things where if there's a health crisis that you would face as an adult, that's one perspective, and you, you pull up your resources and you figure out how how you're going to face that challenge. You know, as Steve Jobs put it, you know, when you have a child, your heart is walking around outside of your body. Um, and I can only imagine what it must be like to have your child going through that because, you know, that concern, that real worry of, you know, your children have to be out of your sight. They have to go to school. They have to, you know, resume their activities and be involved in sports and friends and doing all sorts of things. So you just project forward all those years. And I can see why, and I'm pleased that you did take so much effort and time to really allocate 
your capacity to researching and supporting some of the work that was being done by JDRF and then stepping into that role. So you had uh, four years, a little over four years at JDRF. And what was the impetus to leave? What 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 caught your eye then, and uh, what pulled you into the next project? Well, I, I uh, uh, we had achieved a lot of, of the goals that, that we had set out for the artificial pancreas project with the FDA, with payers, uh, proving that this could actually work. Feasibility was demonstrated. Uh, where we failed, though, and and I uh, can admit uh, it was a miscalculation, was to enter into development partnerships where we were subsidizing the development of technologies at the large medical device companies, uh, people like Medtronic and uh, J&J Animus and, and Roche and Becton Dickinson. We tried to help them move quicker, uh, new sensor technologies, uh, using algorithms and software in order to do decision support or automated dosing for insulin. And unfortunately, with the exception of uh, one relatively minor innovation from Becton Dickinson and an infusion set for insulin, none of the work that uh, we funded is going anywhere. And in fact, the premier example is Animus J&J just got out of the insulin pump business after they took $9 million from JDRF and put some of their own money in it too. They, they actually couldn't do what my co-founder did uh, in 2012 when he hacked into an insulin pump hacked into a continuous glucose monitor, connected them up to a smartphone, uh, put automated uh, dosing uh, intelligence uh, in software on that phone, and created a system that has meaningfully improved the lives of his son and his wife, both of whom have type 1 diabetes, uh, for now going on five years. And what he put together himself, although he's the smartest guy I ever met, Brian Maslisch, I, I will admit, uh, the fact that he put this together himself, and it is better than anything anybody else is going to sell from a medical device company in the next five years, uh, except for Bigfoot, told me that the time had come for a different approach, for different competencies, for different values, for a different kind of company to wrap up technology and actually get into healthcare and medical device at the highest level of risk and importance. Now, wait, I, I think that's amazing. So JDRF was actually underwriting some of the development costs, the R&D costs of these major companies with tremendous budgets and resources and expertise at, at developing medical products. And it was in 2010 to 2014, so fairly recently, but also at a real time of change in the FDA's uh, perspective. I mean, Bakul Patel been, had been working at that period during uh, to develop some of the mobile device regulations and issue various frameworks and trying to get their head around this, especially this new, relatively new uh, device at that point, the iPhone and all the, the capabilities that that offered. But then your co-founder was able to do this himself. Now, he's he's a very smart person from what I read. Uh, he was a quant trader, right, on Wall Street. And uh, That's right. Can you That's tell right. me a little bit about his story, about how what his experience was like and what drove him to actually just look around, do the same sort of research, I guess, you did and say, well, there's nothing out there and then dig deep and take his engineering and development skills and then create something himself. Yeah, well, he, he will tell you that his wife, who had had type 1 diabetes for a long time, uh, who he met in college and, and they had been married for a long time, he, he will tell you that he didn't really understand the burden that she lived with on a daily basis because she, uh, Harvard-trained pediatrician, she, she embraced it. She didn't need his help. She uh, basically lived with the disease. And so in a way, he was shielded from it. But then when their son was diagnosed, he was the one getting up in the middle of the night as well. And, and he was the one trying to give insulin and, and, and make sure that his son uh, landed in the right place, never too low, never too high. And, and he immediately, being exposed to it in such an intimate way, uh, realized that this is a math problem. And it's ridiculous that nobody has any technology available in order to help solve it. It's ridiculous that we, even with a continuous glucose monitor, that when my son goes to his grandmother's, I can't see if he's safe. When all the technology exists, there's a, a device on his body, he, he's got a smartphone with him, but why can't that be hooked up and actually be able to look at a distance and see if he's safe? So uh, just thinking it was unacceptable and having some technical skills himself, he basically shut down his quantitative trading operation, which previously had been uh, geared towards turning the computer on in the morning, have automated stock trading take place, and then have more money in the account at the end of the day than you began with. That, he will tell you, it's actually harder to predict stock prices than it is to predict glucose. Uh, and so he, he took that uh, a competency for doing closed-loop trading algorithms, and he started to focus that on insulin 
and glucose. And he first developed a uh, remote viewing application. So literally that CGM value that would say whether or not his son was in a safe range, he'd be able to see it on his smartphone. And then he started experimenting with algorithms that would predict glucose to help him to dose the insulin at the time that he was giving it. And then he said, let's tie it together. And he first experimented on his wife. That was a key enabler in terms of their development effort because he had his wife, a a physician, to partner with and to uh, actually test on. And only when they had something that they thought was safe and demonstrably superior to what everybody else was doing did they extend that to their son. And uh, they all live safer and easier lives because of it. That's amazing. I love that story. Such a great cocktail. I mean, a a terrible one in terms of the suffering that he had in terms of the diagnosis, but a wonderful opportunity for his skills, his, his wife's skills and her condition, and then to have them come together and develop a product that actually the big guys had not been able to create up until that point. So how did you two meet? We met through the JDRF. He was a donor uh, for that artificial pancreas project I was telling you about. I used to hit him and his wife up for money. Uh, (laughs) And so we knew each other uh, on the circuit there at at JDRF, going to the the dinners and the the different events, the walks. uh, And uh, we we were both in a a similar sort of situation. Uh, We were very fortunate, relatively young in life, to have some amazing opportunities to work in amazing businesses with amazing people and and therefore, we, we had resources at our disposal and we had time and, and we could do something. You know, we, we, we could actually have our families uh, continue to uh, uh, do what they do and, and then direct our efforts towards areas where, you know, it wasn't really clear. Uh, uh, there were a lot of commercial incentives. Uh, I consider our, Brian, myself and a, a few other people who have been working on this problem for a while to just be very lucky. We were given the freedom at a point where we could invest the time to understand the problem and understand how complex it was. And I like to say I was, uh, uh, I've was i had a 12-year apprenticeship in medical device. <laughs> I mean, I was on the outside learning, and I was learning about healthcare. I was learning about the incentives that drive it, the perverse incentives that undermine it. And then once I had a level of understanding and competence, uh, I jumped in the game, and I decided to do it with Brian. Th- this is uh, what we think is our life's mission. If maybe a little thing, there were things earlier in life that were easier, that's so that we could do this. And uh, this is certainly the most important and most impactful thing that I'm ever going to do with my life because it's going to help a lot of people, first off with my son, uh, of course, and, and Brian's family. But uh, there's a much larger group of people out there who need it. And that's irrespective of income or ability to see fancy doctors. The solutions that we're developing are going to scale. And that's a very different approach than uh, how traditional medical devices is done. And one of the things I love about it is that uh, aside from the experience that you had at JDRF, I mean, but you had a, a wealth of knowledge before JDRF, you didn't come to Bigfoot with a huge medical device background. I mean, yes, you had worked with the medical device companies through your role at JDRF, but before that, you'd done, you know, this economic development work, you were working with Ticketmaster and a variety of different companies. And, you know, I've said it many times in this program, and I've said it throughout my life that really, it's, it's the people who come from outside of healthcare that are affected by healthcare that are going to find these ways to transform it. You've just given a great example of that, where you and your role at JDRF were, were funding these big companies that should be able to solve these problems. And then you joined forces with your co-founder to really form this company. So first of all, tell me how you came together. Did you guys say, hey, let's join together. Let's take your product and, and my experience of working with these big companies and develop a product. And if so, wh- where did you get started? What did you do? Uh, well, we, we sat down in, in uh, uh, the 25th uh, floor garage in Midtown Manhattan, uh, <laughs> which was where Brian worked. Uh, it was the place where Bigfoot was born because we both lived in New York City uh, at the time. Uh, two guys came together and, and basically said, you know, uh, there is nobody working on this problem in a way that they're going to be successful. Existing medical device companies don't have the competencies in digital, in cybersecurity, in uh, algorithms, data science, artificial intelligence, uh, design from a consumer perspective. They don't have that kind of stuff going for them, and they don't even know what they don't know. But then the Googles and the Apples of the world, they do know about that stuff, but they don't even want to know about medical device because why would they? There's way easier ways to scale and make money in unregulated aspects of the economy. 
They want to be the enablers, the infrastructure for everything. This particular problem, class three medical device that requires clinical trials and heavy oversight by regulatory authorities, th this requires both of the competencies, those medical device competencies, those consumer and, and digital competencies, enterprise competencies, all that has to come together. And, and we thought that we were the right nucleus in order to assemble that plan and that nobody else was going to do it. So we had to give it a go. It was our responsibility to give it a go because we knew what the answer was. And that was the beginning of the journey. But where did you start, though? I mean, so the two of you got together in this garage and you started, you decided, let's form this company. I love the name Bigfoot. I'm not sure what the background of that name is. Is there a story there? There is, actually. Uh, there was an article in Wired Magazine in, in I think, 2013, maybe 2014, that had gone out to explore this phenomenon of people hacking into their own medical devices to improve them. This concept of uh, CGM and, and actually creating the remote viewing capability for it. And then there was a rumor out there that somebody had actually tied CGM and, and insulin pumps together and created the first un quote unquote artificial pancreas, which we refer to as automated insulin delivery. Brian was the guy and he wouldn't admit it to the reporter because he, he wasn't really trying to do this as an ego project. And he, at that time, he was deeply uh, engaged trying to talk to companies to give away what he had created. He had went to the FDA to see if he could put it on the internet and, and give away the recipe to people. They said, no, you're not doing that. <laughs> but uh, he, he was uh, looking for the broader effort to deliver it to the most people, not to do it as a way to attract attention to himself. Uh, so he wouldn't admit it. Uh, the author said, it's rumored that this uh, has been done out in the wild. It's kind of like Bigfoot. A bunch of people would say it exists. I haven't uh, actually seen it yet, but I'm still looking. So he kind of got named Bigfoot uh, by that article. We thought that that was a very uh, compelling name around which we could build a really great consumer brand in reaching out to the people who are affected by this disease. This is a new aspect uh, to how I believe medical device is going to work in the future for chronic disease because the customer is the person who uses it, not the doctor who prescribes it. And that's a transformational uh, uh, opportunity here because if you're designing for that person, a real world example where you know that person doesn't always read instructions or listen to the doctor or and also does a lot of uh, unpredictable things, hardening uh, for real world use in your design, making it simple, making it self-trainable, making it easy is a very different design process and a very different design target than traditionally what medical device companies know. So we, we set out to design that to assemble the pieces that would be necessary it means we had to get ourselves an insulin pump. We had to get ourselves a continuous glucose monitor. We had to develop the software in order to be on a smartphone to be the interface but also have the firmware on the medical device itself in order to create a security architecture that would make that safe. We went and, and uh, began to assemble the pieces. And the reason we're in Silicon Valley now is that there was an insulin pump company that had invested about $150 million over 10 years to develop a, a really compelling consumer-friendly insulin pump. Uh, they uh, didn't have the smarts in that pump that we uh, were aspiring to bring. And so they... Uh, being forced to market, essentially uh, couldn't pull off an IPO and then shut down operations. We came in and put an exploding offer on the table and pulled off a miracle in terms of getting this asset for next to nothing. So from that day, I've lived in Silicon Valley. I called my wife and said, you know, are you up for this? Um, which is not just a business. It's a, you know, it's a way to help our son and a bunch of other people. Uh, Brian stood about 10 feet away from me and made the same call to his wife. And uh, we moved from that 25th uh, floor garage in Midtown Manhattan uh, out to Silicon Valley uh, from that day. That was the first piece of the puzzle, the, the insulin pump. That's brilliant. Uh, just in terms of that article from Wired Health, I've actually found two articles, and I'll make sure I link them in the show notes of this podcast. But I found one that's about you in 2010 talking about your son. Is it Sean, your son? That's my son. Yep. 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 So we've got that article here talking to you in 2010, I guess right as you were beginning uh, your engagement with JDRF and, and uh, doing some work Right there. before I became CEO, that's yep, right. Yep, yep. And then another one about Bigfoot and about the, the name and the anonymity that the reporter was uh, guaranteeing in order to be, try to get an interview with this elusive character. But I think it's a great yep. name, and uh, and, and I'm, I'm pleased that you're having such great success and that you were able to get out there to California and, and take advantage of uh, this technology to build your system around. What did you do for funds? Did you guys self-fund this, or did you go out there with, and, and try to raise money? We self-funded it. 
we paid uh, five million dollars for all the assets of this insulin pump company, uh, and we didn't have five million in the bank, uh, so th- th- that came out of our pockets. But it's the best deal that I'm ever going to get in my life. It was one of those things where it was there for a moment. If we were willing to seize it, and I had to make a big bet that this was going to work, I hadn't done due diligence. We we didn't know really what we were buying, uh, but we knew that it, it was going to be a good thing, and we'd work it out later. It's turned out to be an amazing thing, and uh, we self-funded it. Uh, we had a, a small network of people who, high net worth individuals, families that I had come across in my history with JDRF, people who took a bet on us and said, "This is the team that has the motivation and the competency in order to solve this problem." Uh, I'm going to help them. Uh, so the first twenty million dollars came from people like that, who uh, were mission friendly. They saw this as a big commercial opportunity, but they were doing it primarily because they believed in us and they wanted to help their, their families. About twenty million dollars into it, everybody realized this is a huge business. If you can change the paradigm for care for type one diabetes and bring digital, bring security, bring consumer competency in terms of design and ease of use, that you can change the world and defray billions of dollars in healthcare costs for people going to emergency rooms for insulin dosing errors. And now the world's on fire with consumerization of medical device, with the internet of things in healthcare, with prescriptive analytics uh, that will basically, artificial intelligence that will do things for you at the point of patient, not just the point of care. Uh, all that stuff that now they have names for and uh, that the digital health universe is on fire to do. We've been doing for three years. We didn't know what it was called when we started. We'll dive back into our conversation in just a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you about an exciting upcoming event that is dedicated to catalyzing the adoption of digital health technology and clinical orthopedics. It's the only one of its kind, and it's a great one. DocSF is the digital orthopedic conference and is supported in part by the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. DocSF will be held just before the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference in the beautiful city of San Francisco on Sunday, January 7, 2018. This year's focus for the innovation competitions will be artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and augmented reality. The keynote dives into the future of sensors and clothing, and the various talks by world-renowned speakers will cover robotics, automation, and cybersecurity. There are also special sessions on leadership, policy, and design thinking, developed with content partners such as IDEO and BTS. Now you might be asking, why is this conference exclusively around digital orthopedics? Well, implementing digital technologies in an integrated vertical like orthopedics is more likely to affect change than targeting the entire healthcare sector at once. This conference isn't just talking about change. It's focused on moving the ball forward by targeting the key leaders in healthcare who are positioned to make change happen. This conference attracts top professionals from the medical device industry, investors, entrepreneurs, and payers. In short, it brings together all the people who get stuff done in healthcare. Hashtag GSD. Head out to San Francisco for this conference and meet many of the guests that have been on this program, including Dr. Daniel Kraft, Nick Adkins, Professor Shafi Ahmed, Dr. Justin Barad, Jamie Edwards, and of course, the founder and chair of DocSF, Professor Stefano Bini. And as a listener of this program, you can enjoy a 30% discount. Visit docsf.org and use discount code DHT30. Tell them you heard about it here. Again, that's docsf.org and use discount code DHT30. Or simply follow the link from the show notes of this podcast. Now let's jump back to the conversation. You're about to celebrate your three-year anniversary with Bigfoot. You formed it in November 2014, right? That's correct. And your product is really tying together the consumer technology that we're all using in so many various areas of our lives and this medical grade technology. So tell me how you manage that sort of interface, because that's a real sticky area, isn't it, for the FDA? Let me step back for a second and, and talk about the FDA and their approach to this kind of stuff. Let's do it. Um, not getting into regulatory science, but just in terms of what the real challenges are. During uh, JDRF's, uh, uh, my JDRF tenure, I had an amazing opportunity and the FDA made it possible. Literally, I got an opportunity because of the – not because of me, but because of the immense credibility and capabilities of the advocacy organization that is JDRF to sit with Margaret Hamburg, then uh, FDA commissioner, and Jeff Shuren, who heads up the device uh, area of FDA. And they asked us for these novel therapies to come to get to them with a proposal for guidance about how they should regulate informed by the patient's perspective on risks and benefits. 
because it's all about risks and benefits, right? Nothing works perfectly forever. Every machine is going to fail. Uh, everything breaks. There's always uh, a need for a mitigation of some failure. It, it's do you get more out of it? Are people safer? Do they live better? Do they live easier and longer? That's the whole uh, discussion. And the FDA brought us in and let us inform the process. That is the reason Medtronic had their approval happen in 89 days, an absolute record for a consumer-focused class 3 medical device that doses a dangerous drug that could kill you if given in the wrong amount. JDRF paved the way, and the FDA is there. This stuff has to be safe, and it has to be scalable for the average person, even when they're misusing it. That's the standard of design. And I don't think the FDA is unreasonable. I think the FDA has been amazing over the last four years in holding us accountable for delivering safe devices, but giving us the opportunity to educate them, to actually collaborate with them, and to demonstrate the value and opportunity in literally transforming lives, if not saving lives. And so the FDA is not the problem anymore. The problem is the companies. They don't want to actually do what's required to make these devices safe and to tie them up to the internet to make them connected to an app on a smartphone that you can buy at the Apple store. They don't want to do the hard things that are necessary in order to achieve those goals because they have to change too many aspects of their business. They have to change the fundamental architecture of their products, the competencies of the people who develop them, how they test them, how they distribute them, how they package them. They have to change everything. And the opportunity here is to work productively with the FDA. They're not the problem anymore. Yeah. And look, I want to dive into that a little bit. But first on the FDA side, I 100% agree. The FDA has been very collaborative. I've worked with them for many, many years on various aspects because that's what happens when you are innovating technology. You have to work collaboratively with the regulators because they're trying to figure out this stuff as we as developers and innovators and business people are trying to figure out how this is going to work as well. So Working collaboratively, just like the aerospace and airline industry works collaboratively with the FAA, you have to work collaboratively with the FDA and and approach them. And I think it's great that they invited you in to make some recommendations. And I was making proposals back when uh, Pakul Patel was uh, issuing his preliminary drafts of the mobile device directives and things like that. But I want to go in and challenge a little bit on that second piece. So what, what do you mean the problem is the companies? Can you give me any examples without, you know, I don't want to name and shame people, but can you give me any, any ideas about why you're coming out with that, that sort of comment that it's really the, the company's problems now? So if, if you go to the insulin pump companies today and you ask them, why can't I load an app on my phone that is going to allow me to use that as an interface to my insulin pump so that I can have the richness of that environment in iOS. I don't have to actually out myself as having a chronic disease every time I want to give myself insulin with my peers at lunch or with my girlfriend at dinner. How can I integrate this thing that's so helpful and so useful and so much the center of my life in every other aspect with my uh, insulin delivery? The companies will tell you, every company but Bigfoot, that the FDA won't let them do it. And it's just not, simply not true. Now, why they tell you that is, uh, I, I will give them maybe the uh, benefit of the doubt that in some cases maybe they don't understand how to do it. Uh, but I think mostly it's about they'll have to change their product in such a fundamental way that would be so costly or require competencies that they don't have. Uh, they don't want to do it. So for instance, you can't just add an app to an existing insulin pump and be able to dose insulin. That's what Brian did with when he hacked into an insulin pump. He demonstrated by doing so that it's a fundamentally insecure device, and while that was a great thing for him to be able to do, and now 600 more people around the world have actually downloaded the formula and done it themselves, that's a scary thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that somebody could actually come up behind me with an insulin pump and wirelessly command it to dose all of the insulin in, in, in the pump into my body could kill me if I didn't actually know what was going on. It would kill me if I didn't know what was going on. So that's a scary thing. The same yeah. opportunity that Brian seized demonstrates a fundamental security flaw. So for instance, uh, the largest uh, insulin pump company in the world, in order to solve that problem, they didn't come up with a secure device in their next generation. They literally disconnected it from anything else so it no longer can talk to a phone in any way, uh, <laughs> which goes back in time to basically have a silo for the medical device and then your consumer life, which is just completely and totally separate. There is no way for the current generation of insulin pumps 
uh, as they get updated, they're going the other direction. They're, they're taking them off the grid. That's because they have to go back and do a fundamental design exercise to change the architecture of the pump. You can't bolt on security. You literally have to go back to the drawing board and design it from the ground up in terms of the computational capacity, the support for cryptography on the medical device itself, how it communicates in an authenticated way with the phone, how that phone communicates with the cloud system that has the key that knows which user should be able to pair one medical device with that phone. You need to develop the whole system. At the time of manufacturing, you actually have to embed a crypto chip in the device itself. You know, like our new credit cards have those crypto chips. It's the same way a Tesla works in terms of authenticating the firmware downloads so that when a Tesla, uh, you go out in the morning and sometimes you can have an updated car because the firmware updated and your dash looks different. Well, you don't want anybody but Tesla talking to the car. So in order to do that, they've developed a security architecture that's fundamentally embedded within the product, the manufacturing process, the uh, network that it connects to in order to update it. All of that Bigfoot has had to develop too. These companies don't want to do all that. So they tell the public FDA won't let us do it. Okay. All right. So I, I'm with you there in terms of the, the excuse that people give. A lot of times it's, you know, blame the regulators and people want to buy into that. It's, it's, it's an easy sell. You know, hey, the FDA yeah. won't let me do it. Then people say, oh, geez, you know, FDA, get it together. But as you pointed out, it's not the FDA's fault in this, in this respect. Uh, you know, there's a, a process in place and people can follow it. I, I think the reason isn't perhaps that the companies don't want to do it. They haven't had to do it yet. There hasn't been a demand that people will stop using their products because there's an alternative yet. And that's when we see things. It's the same reason that Kodak didn't embrace digital cameras 20-something you know, years ago. Even though they invented them. Exactly. They <laughs> thought they were in the chemicals and papers business and not the picture-taking business. So, so a lot of these things, when people are looking at innovation, it's because they haven't had to change. Well, this is the classic uh, innovator's dilemma, right? It is When you're making money, you don't need to change and you don't want to change. None of us changes unless we have to, right? I don't get home on time and, and, and pay attention to dinner uh, until my wife says, hey, you know, you're going to be here. Uh, I need you here. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I'm going to do that. Uh, we need an external prompt to actually be better, uh, to actually improve. Uh, that's what competition is. And when medical device companies find themselves in preeminent positions where they don't have competition, why would they change? And, and there are a bunch of examples of that. Competition is a good thing, and it's coming to healthcare. Yep, and I want to hear about what you're doing with Abbott and where the product is now. Fill me in. Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we needed to assemble some pieces. So we brought the software, we brought the security, we brought the design, we brought all the stuff that Silicon Valley can bring. We needed some medical device components that are expensive and, and challenging to build and take many years. We got very fortunate with uh, being able to acquire an insulin pump, insulin infusion technology. We acquired uh, also a dose capture technology for people who are taking shots because it's not all just about pumping. It's about however you take insulin, whether you're taking shots, whether you're taking uh, it through a pump. We're going to capture that data and feed it into an artificial intelligence system that is going to help you to dose that in the most automated way. We needed a sensor, something that would be easy to use on your body, uh, stream uh, a wireless signal that would give the glucose values, that would talk to our devices, and that would become a fundamental input into the artificial intelligence system that drives the delivery of insulin. Uh, Abbott has the best, most user-friendly, cost-effective, most scalable technology. It's an amazing story of one big company that did what I think is going to be the most groundbreaking innovation in diabetes for more than a decade. And it is a great partner for us because uh, th they've crossed the threshold of being able to take blood glucose monitoring out of the equation. You no longer have to prick your finger. Um, uh, continuous glucose monitoring seemed like a great idea. Put this thing on your body. You know what your glucose is all the time. But it required calibration, pricking your finger multiple times a day. And that was dangerous because people did it badly. They don't wash their hands. They actually, if you have coffee creamer on your hand, let alone uh, the glazed sugar donut you ate before or a bunch of other uh, chemicals that you wouldn't uh, actually expect are going to trigger a very different glucose reading when you do that test. You're literally dependent upon that process and the user being compliant with washing their hands, using an alcohol swab, using the second drop of blood, not the first drop of blood. Things you can get people to do in clinical trials that you'll never get them to do scalably in the real world. Abbott basically moved beyond that. It's calibrated at the factory. It is the simplest, most scalable, most easy to use glucose monitoring technology, and we're going to build a whole product around it.
Uh, you know, I saw the product in Europe first. It was actually just recently approved by the FDA. Was it September 29th or so, or September 28th? I think it was uh, was approved by the FDA. It is a fantastic product, and everyone that I've talked to who's used it just talks about it in such a transformative experience. Sort of like when they went from their BlackBerry to their iPhones. You know, in terms of just a, it's a game changer. Yeah, th- and that's that's a that's a con- when you listen to people talk about it, they say I love it. It's it's a consumer uh, brand. It's a consumer experience that they're focused on. It's a relationship to help somebody in a fundamental aspect of living their lives. You never hear people talk like that about other medical devices. Abbott has done something very special. And when you think about what you can do in terms of gathering data, like now you've taken away a lot of the friction of the glucose monitoring process, right? I mean, you, you don't have to worry about cleaning your hands or having lancets or whatever. You can do this on a plane or wherever you are standing and sitting, and you can do it multiple times to just create so much more data to inform the the algorithms and, and your own decision-making about how you're what you're eating, how you're eating, what exercise you're, you're doing, and everything else. It's just going to really explode the information that we're going to have available to draw some real knowledge out of. Absolutely. And that's that's what we're doing. If, if you want to cut back to the core of what Bigfoot is, it's a data business. Um, you're getting data and you're doing something with it in order to benefit the customer, the patient, the doctor who oversees that patient's care. And ultimately, and this is the big innovation, the payer to tie it back to healthcare economic outcomes that are going to not only drive halting and uh, begrudging reimbursement decisions, but make them active advocates for the penetration of the technology because it actually saves them money. And that you can demonstrate doing so as a company, that's the future of healthcare. That's exciting. What does the future hold for Bigfoot Biomedical over the next two years or so? What, what can we expect to see on that horizon? Well, we've got all the pieces, and now we're in the process of doing final assembly and development and rolling into pivotal trials for two class three systems end of next year. One is an artificial intelligence-driven smartphone uh, enabled using the interface of the smartphone to use the chronic disease management system for the pump, and then a parallel one that is going to connect to insulin pens and basically allow you for shots to have as much automation as is possible. It is uh, artificial pancreas for shots, which is what most of the world is going to do for the foreseeable future. We're going to have a selection of choices. Uh, However you want to take insulin, however your insurance company will pay for you to take insulin, we'll provide you the easiest, simplest, safest way that your payer is going to reimburse. With the mobile device connection, is the mobile device actually going to be controlling the Abbott device or is it going to be simply a display mechanism? Well, well, first of all, the Abbott device uh, in our architecture talks to the pump or talks to the pen. It doesn't even talk to the phone. So the loop and all the intelligence is embedded in the medical devices. That's how you do a phone is... You make it kind of like a monitor and a keyboard is to a CPU today. The medical device in our context is the CPU. That's where all the calculations get done. That's the validated lockdown medical device that the FDA is very concerned always works the way it's supposed to work. The phone, you can't guarantee it's always going to work that way or that it's even going to be around. It's going to run out of battery. You'll be playing Angry Birds. I know that dates me. Uh, And it's going to actually reboot. There are all sorts of things because it's a fragile device relative to the standards of medical technology. But that's okay because nothing important happens on it. It's an interface that gives you the opportunity when you have it and when it is uh, booted up in order to do the management tasks that are necessary to stay safe. However, the device itself needs to have all the smarts and it needs to have a basic ability to communicate any error conditions any alarms or any time the person is unsafe, and therefore they need to be designed together. This is why you can't just build a pump, lock it down, build an app, put them together. The device needs to be designed in the context of the phone being present most of the time, not present some of the time, and then sometimes that device needs to be the primary interface. But you need to have a sharing of responsibilities across an architecture that distributes intelligence. This is a system uh, rather than a device or a component. It's a new way of thinking that includes everything in the actual package of the product, including how it's reimbursed, including how it's delivered, including how many prescriptions you get for it, in our case, one, uh, trying to take as much complexity out of the process as possible. The business model innovation is just as important as the technology or product design innovation. So absolutely, I 
entirely agree with what you just described there. But just for clarity, the calculations and all the algorithms are going to reside on the medical devices, on the insulin pump and the glucose meter, continuous glucose meter. You're just using that iPhone or whatever phone as a display and management tool, not to actually perform anything. I guess because I, you know, you never know what's going to happen with the mobile phone. It could get lost. It could have, uh, you know, it could have a dead battery. Um, absolutely. If, if you're, all those things will happen. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you're relying on the cloud for calculations, then there's some advantages in terms of if you need to update software, things that is happening in your cloud on your servers in the cloud. As opposed to on the device, you can't always make sure that you have the latest firmware if it hasn't been connected or, or updated. But the advantage there is that, that at least you know if that device is present, that it's going to be able to run that calculation on, on the local device, right? It's a complex design process that basically looks at every piece of it and says, how reliable is this piece and how often can I count on it being available? For the most important things where you can't get them wrong and they need to be working all the time in the correct way, that needs to be the thing that's the medical device and I carry around with me. And I have to be able to guarantee and validate and actually demonstrate to the FDA that it's always going to work in the way it's supposed to work. I can't do that to the app on the phone because sometimes it's not going to be available. So I can only put things there that are okay if they don't happen in real time. Or it's okay if there's some delay before they happen. And then you actually look at the cloud. I, I, I only can only put things there that are going to happen relatively infrequently and are low risk if they don't happen. These are things that uh, aren't life critical. they are things like gathering data over time to provide insight to your doctor or to the, your payer. There are things like software upgrades that will basically increase functionality and actually enable you to use the device more powerfully over time. It's a hierarchy of needs. The things that are being carried around with you, the medical devices, they have to work all the time in the way that they're approved to work, no questions asked. We've done that, but it requires that the design uh, accommodate that at every level, and it can't be done in isolation. You can't do them sequentially. You have to do them all at the beginning. And that's why a startup has a tremendous advantage, because literally, if you have an existing operating business, you can't change everything overnight and still have a business. You have to be thinking about sequencing and staging. And every once in a while, the world is changing so quickly that a new set of technologies become available across all operating and technological aspects of a business. That's today. Um, and that's why healthcare is about to change in a big way. And I actually think we only have a hazy idea of how much. Are you working on an international approach here as well to try to get this through the CE process and into the European market, perhaps as an interim step or an earlier step than getting it uh, through the, the entire FDA process? It's anticipated, but not planned yet. Uh, and the reason for that is the investors are not interested in funding uh, European expansion because they see the reimbursement timelines is so long. The single payer systems, uh, there's a lot of risk and then a very long cultivation period in order to enter those kind of markets, especially for a startup. The reimbursement that can be achieved most quickly is here in the US. So investors only want to pay for a US focused business. And now that the FDA has uh, become amenable to this kind of uh, innovation, this is the place where we focused. Uh, now that we have that plan and that we're going down the path such that people have confidence we're going to reach the U.S. market, we're going to start raising capital in order to boot up some other parallel efforts. But uh, it's actually kind of funny that historically the big medical device companies would launch things in Europe first and then not sell very many of them. Uh, the reimbursement was here, but the FDA path was more challenging. Now that that has been effectively fixed in our space and there is a path forward to innovation, uh, you're going to see a lot more focus on the U.S. market because it's the most commercially viable uh, soonest. But the rest of the world is a big place and a big opportunity, and there's China too. So I think about the world in terms of the U.S., the European markets, and China, and we're going to have a strategy pursued on those three parallel paths probably within the next 18 months. Well, there you go, Europe. You've heard it directly from Jeffrey. That's the challenge. That's the perception. That's what the investors want to fund. And it's up to these markets, right, to find the solutions that will help to incentivize the investors who are funding these sorts of developments to show them how they can get that capital repaid and more faster by working in these various markets. So we have a, a global audience to this podcast. We'll see what ideas the audience comes up with and see if we can uh, feed into that 18-month journey that you're, you're planning to uh, develop in these other markets. Fantastic. I'm really pleased that you and Brian Maslisch uh, joined up and 
I'm sorry that each of you have children who have type 1 diabetes, but I'm thrilled to see you guys leading such an exciting uh, venture forward and uh, really changing the face of what people are experiencing, millions of people around the world are experiencing, and look forward to keeping track of your progress and continuing to hear about your development and the pending launch of your, of your product. Well, I appreciate your interest in our story. We've got a lot of work to do yet, but we, uh, we feel lucky to have the opportunity to do it. Jeffrey, I have a few questions I'd like to ask every guest. Do you have a few more minutes for me? Sure. Excellent. Jeffrey, what is a saying, quote, or phrase that motivates you? I don't know where I heard this or if I did hear it or if it's a blend of things, but I, I often like to say that uh, you know, th- things are impossible until you convince people they can be done, then they become inevitable. And I think that's very applicable to healthcare. A lot of people are saying it can't be done, it can't be changed, it'll never change. But once you get up ahead of steam and you get a small core of believers that they can change, you'd be amazed at the change that the world can see. What advice do you have for others working to innovate in healthcare? Think in terms of systems. You have to look at a solution. A piece doesn't solve anything. You have to think about the workflow of the people who are involved, the clinicians, the patients, even the payers. You have to think about does this solve a problem? Uh, And does it solve a problem in a mutually complementary way for the different constituencies that need to be served? And those are patients, providers, and payers. Think in terms of systems. You have to think big in order to solve problems in healthcare is what I've learned over a long period of time. What book do you recommend to our listeners? I, I read an interesting book called Losing the Signal about the rise and fall of BlackBerry. One of the most amazing books and amazing stories in terms of That company rose from nothing to be a world dominator with like an 80% share of the uh, what was the smartphone market, and then in a period of a couple years, nothing. And the rise and fall, and looking at how technology was changing in the background to enable, but then also to completely disable and gut uh, (laughs) that company, uh, it's an amazing story and one which every entrepreneur that sees themselves surfing the wave and and becoming a thing, you can become not the thing just as quickly as you can become the thing. It's a really interesting example of that. What piece of tech do you use that you wouldn't want to live without? Uh, well, uh, sorry to give you the cliched answer, but the you know the smartphone has just begun to change our lives. Uh, I thought you were actually going to say that it was the Bigfoot medical device. Well, you know, I, I would say that is going to be the most important uh, device in anybody's life, but it doesn't exist yet, unfortunately. Right. Um, for for people who uh, uh, are are using it, uh, uh, the hacked versions of these mm-hmm. are, are fundamental. Uh, unfortunately, my son, who's now 22 years old. Uh, he's not engaged enough with diabetes or, or taking care of himself to the extent that he would use one of these hacked systems because the hacked systems are kind of fragile. You know, you've got to reboot them. The connectivity drops out. They take too much work, um, mm-hmm. and he isn't up for it right now. So that would be the most uh, important device in my life if my son were using it. Um, my son needs Bigfoot, which is the hardened version of that that's mm-hmm. just so but simple that it works all the time. And it actually is going to save him time and he's going to do better in terms of his health without doing any more work. The most important device in my life doesn't exist yet. If I gave you a check for $5 million for you to invest in health technology today, how would you invest it? I'd invest it in Bigfoot uh, because we need a bunch of money in order to do what we're doing. Uh, The the challenge and the reason this hasn't been done, what we're doing, is that you need to raise a couple hundred million dollars in order to do it. That's a lot of money um, uh, that you need to know up front you're going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to get it through the process. It's a multi-year journey. You have to have a lot of people say yes to what you're doing. FDA, uh, payers, uh, docs, and then ultimately patients at the end of the line. These are risky businesses and that capital doesn't really exist to fund them. It's a very uh, uh, tarnished space. People have lost a lot of money in class three medical devices. Solving big problems, uh, putting capital to work against big problems, that's, uh, I think, the, the future and there aren't enough people doing it. Are you raising money now? I am. It so happens. Uh, we're uh, in the process of moving towards a uh, closing round. Still herding up uh, members of the syndicate. We're going to raise between fifty and seventy-five million dollars. This is uh, uh, this is a big lift. Uh, but uh, we have uh, coincided with an, an awakening, I, I think, in terms of the digital health opportunity, and, and explicitly around digital health and how it will be married to medical devices. That has opened a lot of people's eyes. So. We have good timing at Bigfoot, which if you look at any success story, and I, I 
fully intend and, and uh, believe we will be one, you'll find that the company had good timing. Whether it knew it or not, it, it entered the business at the right time. It used the right technologies at the right stage of maturity. It contacted the partners when they were most susceptible. And then ultimately, it contacted the investors when they were ready to hear the story. So how should people contact you if they're interested in participating in your next round? Well, they can uh, uh, email me at jbrewer at bigfootbiomedical.com or else they can uh, come to our Facebook page where we've already got 70,000 people, about a quarter of what Medtronic Diabetes has, the largest player in the space, uh, following our journey, our clinical trials, meeting our people. This is a very different world. Um, we're already recruiting our customers uh, and we are two and a half years from having a product in the marketplace. And we got people putting the hashtag, I believe in Bigfoot in their Facebook posts. There's a very big audience of people out there for whom this is the biggest thing in their life. Uh, if they could actually have a solution that would serve them better and help them to live their lives in, in a safer and easier way, we're already talking to them. And by the time we come to market, we're going to have a lot of awareness. We'll have demand that's already pent up and ready to be unleashed. That's a very different model than medical devices ever known before. And we're exploiting every opportunity to see how the world's changed and how we could actually be benefited from it in the uh, doing of what is a very ambitious mission. The last question I have for you is, uh, we make a contribution to a charity in appreciation of your time on this show. What charity have you selected and can you tell me a little bit about what they do? Well, that's an easy one. I would say the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, JDRF, uh, as they're known today. Uh, it's a uh, organization which has a global footprint so there's a JDRF in the UK, in Australia, and a number of other places. They have uh, funded a couple billion dollars of research since their founding in 1970. But just as importantly, they're active in regulatory advocacy to try and find a pathway forward for this kind of innovation in reimbursement to make sure there's a model to get it paid for. It's a organization which plays a fundamental role because it's really respected for its being focused on the interests of the patient. That's where my money would go and does. Excellent. Well, thank you for nominating them. I will make sure that we get a, a donation made in your name. Uh, that's a great organization. We'll have a link to JDRF on the website and encourage listeners to make a donation uh, themselves to that organization. So we've got Bigfoot Biomedical on Twitter. So it's at Bigfoot Biomed. You've got a Facebook page. Bigfoot Biomed. So we've got that. We've got your email address. I'll include on the, uh, the show notes for this episode. Anything else you'd like to tell the listeners before I let you go? Uh, I, I just like to say that... Uh... There are big problems in healthcare to be solved. There's a lot of skepticism whether it can change very quickly. Every once in a while, things change quicker than we ever thought possible. We're in one of those periods. Anybody who's trying to do the big things, don't give up hope because uh, the, the ground underneath us is shifting in a way that makes a lot of things possible that weren't possible before. Uh, I'm talking about even things that weren't possible last year. So uh, I couldn't be more excited. And uh, like I said, this is the right time to make big changes. There you have it. That was Jeffrey Brewer, CEO and co-founder of Bigfoot Biomedical. Check out all the links to everything we discussed by visiting digitalhealthtoday.com forward slash 47. While you're there, please take a minute to subscribe to the podcast. You can do that by clicking on the iTunes link or the Stitcher app on the side of the page. Many thanks to our partner, DocSF, the digital orthopedic conference being held in San Francisco on January 7th. Register at docsf.org and get 30% off with the code DHT30. If you'd like to be a part of the show, please get in touch with me directly. We have some great innovation partnership packages available, and I'd love to share them with you. Follow me on Twitter at HealthTechDan and follow the show at DHealthToday. That's all for me for now. Until next time, keep on innovating.